This is Ken. His name could be James, Pedro, or Ahmed. He's a student. He's a guy next door. He's your brother. He's my son. He spent the quarantine in bed, half showered, half dressed, in front of a camera, dark screen, absent, muted, confused. This is Selena, Diana, Dayu. She's her manager. She's your auntie. She is my friend. She spent the quarantine tending to children, juggling household chores, rising expectations of her professional environment, and attending Zoom calls. Exercise online, virtual conference online, family online. She wanted to climb the walls of her apartment and break every single stone in them 25 million times. I'm fine, she says. Really, I'm fine. This is Bart and Sarah, Michael and Inge, you name them. They're your grandparents. They're your neighbors. They're my mom and dad. We spent a quarantine isolating ourselves to protect them. They spent a quarantine isolating themselves to be protected. We are afraid to lose them. When elders go, our maturity is propelled forward. We don't like to grow up. They don't like to die. In March 2020, I was full of plans. I've only lived in Spain for a couple of years by then, and until then, I spent most of my energy invested in building a new life with two kids in a brand new country. Finally, kids were okay. Uh, my oldest son, a teenager at that point, um, was a new, attending a new school, hanging out with a group of awesome kids, making music. My youngest son enjoyed his newly found freedom without looming supervision of his brother. As for me, I have just finished my doctorate studies and I had a submission of my dissertation um, scheduled for June 2020. I also had a ticket for a romantic weekend with my long distance boyfriend in his home country. Haven't seen him in a while. I felt like things are falling finally in place. I was excited to have my happiness with my guy on my own terms. Ticket was booked for March 5th. My heart was dancing. I didn't know that a day before my flight, his home country is gonna close the borders and we will break up a year and a half later, still without seeing each other. I didn't know that um, it will take me another 16 months to finish my PhD, and by the time I'll get there, the only thing that I would feel would be a sense of exhaustion. I didn't know that my oldest son, a teenager, would pour a gallon of water over his laptop in the first week of quarantine, which would lead to a severe case of depression and agoraphobia for almost a year, out of which he would climb out as a loop producer, securing a manager, collapse with um, artists, and making enough revenue to sustain himself in the United States alone or that my youngest son is gonna be the only ray of sunshine in my daily existence for God knows how long. When I was younger, I was obsessed with wanting to know my future. I'm glad that in March 2020, I didn't know it. It would have been a brutal disappointment. This is Janine and Samuel, Ari and Rhonda, Svetlana and Vladimir. They're mentors, psychologists, shepherds, they're the representatives of any helping profession that allows people to go through challenges towards their goals. They have the tools of survival in difficult situations. They're lost a lot more often than they admit to. I'm a coach. I'm one of these shepherds. For corporate and business clients, I do it for a hefty fee. For people in need and students, I do it for a cup of coffee. I call it one coffee shift. You buy me a coffee, I'll help you shift something in your life. Ver lately, coffee has been virtual. Um, and uh, over the past five years that I've been doing this project, I've coached over 250 young people, women, and students uh, all together. And what has started at has, as, as a handful of coaching sessions for strangers ended up being a worldwide community of shifting stories. There is someone in almost every corner of the world who owes me a cup of coffee. 
I like the thought of that. I really like coffee. As a coach, I specialize in high-intensity situations where people are so stuck that they would do anything to get out of the uh, hole they're in. It's uh, high intensity, it's a lot of unknowns, and I like it. I function much better in high intensity, I love the unknown, and so this is my cup of tea, or so I thought before the pandemics. What do you do to maintain sanity as a helper? There are three rules, unspoken rules, that everyone knows but nobody talks about. Rule number one, don't try to help the whole world. It will consume you. Rule number two, don't bring clients' problems home. It will consume a personal life. Rule number three, be aware of the zone of your control. Everything else will consume your existence. I was a professional with many years of experience under my belt. These three rules have saved me over and over and over over the time that I was doing it. Yet it took me only a few weeks of corona to break these rules and crash like a plane with a broken engine. Most of my clients had an issue with an isolation. Uh, it wasn't my case. When I got to Spain, I was alone. Uh, and so by the time corona waltzed around, isolation was my friend. I was very productive, focused, it really helped me. My issue was the staggering and gloomy silence of ghost-like students from one side of the screen and a mirroring silence from my teenager behind the closed door of his room. Another one of my issues was the desperation in the voice of every mother, father, and non-essential worker client that actual business client, not essential business work client, um, that has been there for me, mirroring the desperate voice in my own head. I felt stuck. I was stuck. When I'm stuck, I tend to act. So I did. I reached out to every single person I knew physically or virtually and offered what I knew how to do best, a coaching help to get through the crisis. My lines went off the hook. I wanted to help them all. I had to help them all. I really, really had to. This is Jack. He is the darkest hero of my story. He didn't make it. On a starry night, after a very long day, I received a message from one of my employees in a startup that I co-founded that uh, one of our former associates, junior associates, fell out of the window on the fourth floor and died instantly. She just wanted me to know. I remember that day vividly. I was sitting on the balcony, um, breathing a cool air, drinking a cup of tea with my pink oversized mug, rubbing my neck and shoulders, trying to release some pressure, and uh, feeling that I was going down the hill and losing track of my own life. I felt sorry for myself, and simultaneously, I felt ashamed of feeling sorry. Then I saw the message. I read it, I reread it, I put a phone down and stayed frozen in the chair for about three hours, shivering and sobbing. This was a turning point for me. No matter how much I tried, I could not help them all. I felt powerless. This was outside of the zone of my control. Some of them didn't want to be helped. Others didn't have access to me. Hell, I couldn't even help my own son in the room next door. The world was bigger than me. It consumed me, my personal life, and my existence. And then, then I also felt guilty. Because at the 21st birthday of this young associate, I met his mom. And she was a beautiful woman with straight blonde hair, only slightly older than me now. My son, depressed or not, would wake up next morning, or the morning after. Her son would never wake up. I got lucky, and she didn't. This is Nuria, Peggy, Jessica. She's a fighter. Next morning, when I woke up, I was drinking coffee and realized that I could use a one coffee shift for myself. So I remembered one of the most impactful books that I've ever read in my life, especially in the beginning of my coaching journey. It was uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. 
There were two quotes in particular that spoke to me back then and popped up in my head almost every time when I needed to pick myself up, and they came that morning. Quote number one was that our greatest freedom is the freedom to choose our attitude. Quote number two, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is a normal behavior. When you're abnormally stuck, here are my five abnormal rules how to get out of that scenario. Rule number one, obsess. Obsession is not healthy. I will repeat it. Obsession is not healthy, but it's useful. According to the Newton law of motion, for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So when you are abnormally stuck, obsession over a subject, a dream, a better future, or anything, any kind of situation can actually help you to get out of the rut. My obsession is art. I write, I paint, I love theater. Art is my drug. Art helps me to express myself when I can no longer speak about what's going on inside of me or happens to me. Art is my last and first thread to the numbness of my brain, heart, and soul. Rule number two, rebel. According to the research, we have access to 27 emotions. Anger is one of those emotions we actually don't like to admit to. Anger, interestingly, is also that emotion that helps us to transition from the point of shock to the point of coping. Think of the time when you feel numb. First you feel nothing, and then you feel pain, and then you might feel anger. Anger is rooted in pain. Anger spreads like fire. Rebelling is transforming anger into action. Boy, did I rebel for the next following weeks. Uh, I rebelled against the confinement by taking my son outside around the park when only dog, dog walkers, and essential workers were allowed. I rebelled against the conformity by creating a self-help blog book with all of my illustrations, which listed everything I did in one coffee shift so people could help themselves. I also rebelled against the lack of clarity and uh, recognition of how we all felt during this period. And so I created a list of images, depictions of people that I saw during those days with the way I saw them. These are the images you see on the screen today. I call them my quarantine heroes. They are the product of my rebel and obsession. Rule number three, choose. Making choices, everything in life is a choice. Making choices helps us to feel power over what's happening to us. But how do we know what's the right choice? For me, that was the answer to the question, what is important for me today? The first time I asked myself that question that morning, I realized that finishing my PhD on time was not on the list. I just didn't care. My mental stamina was needed somewhere else, and I had to choose between my mental health and successful outcome on time. I did not touch my dissertation for another six months. Rule number four, structure. Structure, order, routine. Psychologists agree that uh, when we are in a state of uncertainty, repetitive motions and small wins is what helps us to get out of the situation, have a sense of control, and a sense of self-confidence to build it up. So next time you are completely stuck uh, and you feel like the world is crashing, get up, make coffee, work, tend to your kids, friends, family, work, Make art, eat, tend to kids, friends, family, free time, go to bed, wake up, repeat. And the last rule is hope. When all plans fail, hope remains. Fedor Dostoevsky said that um, to live without a hope is to cease to live. Hope is only useful at the time of desperation, but if you choose to live, you inevitably choose to hope. This is Monica. Teresa, Rafi. She's graduating this year, and she hopes that all the knowledge that she has received during the quarantine year is actually going to help her to propel her future career. This is Janaka and Tiffany, Tuta and Kami, Sandy and Susan. They are former colleagues. They had a major fallout during the quarantine over the project that didn't work out, but they've reconciled, and now they hope to start a campaign for a post-pandemic support of working mothers. This is Roger and Erica. 
whatever that is for you. They're part of the movement, hashtag love is not tourism. They hope that love will win after all. Love is important to them. What is important to you today? What is your hope? Thank you.